Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we're looking at a data set of breast cancer data. Um, so it's a bunch of different patients uh, with different uh, uh, tumors. And basically we're going to try to predict if a given tumor is malignant or benign. So um, we have a bunch of uh, features that actually came from digitized images. Um, and we're going to try to, like I said, predict uh, if a given tumor is cancerous. Um, so uh, let's get into the notebook. We're going to use a logistic regression model to make our predictions. However, we're also going to use principal component analysis to reduce the dimension of the data and show that the same or similar results can be achieved with uh, a smaller number of features. So principal component analysis is very useful uh, if, you if you have too many features and you want to represent them in a more um, meaningful manner uh, with fewer features, then the PCA is a great way to do that. And I'll uh, explain about it a bit. It's a, um, I, I might make a video specifically about PCA because it's such a cool topic um, and a little too involved to go into exactly how it works in this video, um, but we will, I will give you a quick rundown. Uh, so we're going to use NumPy and Pandas just for working with the data, and then matplotlib.pyplot and Seaborn for visualization. Uh, then we'll use the standard scalar and train test split function from sklearn for pre-processing, and then we're importing PCA from sklearn.decomposition. Uh, and we're using logistic regression as our model, like I said. So let's go ahead and import that, and we can load in the data using pandas.readcsv. So we'll go up here and grab the file path, uh, data.csv, pass that in, and we'll take a look. So we have 33 columns, which uh, by default, uh, pandas shows only 20 columns, so we have this dot 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 here. Uh, since we can't see all the columns, I'm going into the console and typing pandas.setOption max columns none. That way we can see all of them. If I reload this now, uh, we can see all 33. And at the end we have this uh, sort of uh, unnecessary uh, column with all missing values. Uh, so why don't we, well let's take a little look at the info on the data set. Uh, you can see they're all missing in this column. Uh, additionally we have the ID column which is not going to help us make predictions. Uh, and because this data set requires so little pre-processing I'm just gonna, uh, well I'll just make a pre-processing section but it will be short. Uh, I'd also like to take a look at the diagnosis uh, column. That's uh, the first column here after the ID, and that's what we're trying to predict. So M or F, or sorry, M or B, M for malignant, B for benign. Uh, grab that and take a look at it. And I actually want to take a look at the unique values inside, so dot unique. And you can see we only have two labels. Uh, so we're good to go. Alright, and um, I would like to remove those unnecessary columns to start. So ID and this unnamed 32 column. So data equals data.drop ID, I'll put them in a list, uh, ID and unnamed 32. I'm dropping from axis one and then we can take a look. Uh, so we don't have the ID column at the front and we don't have that extra column at the end. All right, and then um, I'd like to split the target column off from the rest of the data so I'm going to call the target column Y. It's going to be diagnosis. The data sub diagnosis is going to be our Y. So I'll make a copy of it. And X uh, will be all the rest of the data. So data dot drop diagnosis. Uh, we're dropping from access one and I will make a copy. Okay, uh, then I'd like to split once more. This time make like a vertical split uh, taking 70% of the data for the train set and 30% for the test set. So we're going to have X train, X test, that's splitting X, and Y train, Y test, splitting Y. And we're splitting using the train test split function from sklearn. Pass in X and Y, and give it a train size of 70%, it should work. Um, so 70% of the data will go to the train set, and the other 30% will go to the test set. And then uh, I want to include a random state as well. Uh, this can be any number, it's just to ensure that uh, well, this function also shuffles the data, so this will ensure that the shuffle and the split is always made in the same way so that we can reproduce the results of this notebook. Um, so I'm going to run that. Now we have four new sets of the data. 
uh, and I want to scale the X. So X train looks like this, right? It had, doesn't have the diagnosis column, right? That's just in Y train. Uh, you can see B's and M's. Um, and we want to scale it. So what I mean by scale is right now they all take on, each column takes on a different range of values. Some of them are between zero and one. Others can go up to 45 or 72. Um, yeah, this one goes up to 133. So I just want them all to take the same range of values because uh, we're going to be using a linear model today, a logistic regression model, uh, which uh, performs much better when we scale the data. So I'm going to create a scalar object. Uh, I'm going to use a standard scalar from sklearn. Uh, there's multiple kinds of scalars. The standard scalar will give each column a mean of zero and a variance of one, so that most of the values in a given column will lie between negative one and one. And I'm going to fit the scalar uh, to x train. So I'm fitting only to the train set uh, because in a uh, in the wild you uh, wouldn't have access to the test set, right? So uh, you would normally uh, because here we're sort of creating our own test set, but we have to work under the assumption that more test data could come at any time. Uh, so we always want to fit to the train set if we're using any sort of pre-processing object. And then we're going to transform both the train and test set, but using only the fit that we have on the train set. Uh, and by fit here, I just mean it's going to look at each column and um, it's going to calculate how much it should shift it by and how much it should scale it by, and it's going to save that information and that's all the fit does. Then the transform, which is scalar.transform, uh, will actually apply the shift and scale to x train, uh, or in this case, we'll also do it for x test, and that will be our x test. Um, now, I would like to note the scalar.transform function actually returns a numpy array, so I'm gonna turn it back into a data frame afterwards, uh, and we will specify the column names uh, to be the same as the uh, original column names. So columns equals xtrain.columns. And we'll do the same thing here. Just copy this in. Uh, all right, uh, so now it's been scaled. And if we look at xtrain, uh, you can see that all of the columns take on the same range of values, more or less. If we look at the means now, xtrain.mean, i will show the mean for each column. You can see they're all very close to zero. Uh, so, uh, I guess we can do the principal component analysis now. So, principal component analysis for dimensionality reduction. Uh, actually, before we go into it, I do want to run the model on just the train set. Uh, sorry, so training uh, and results. Uh, I'm not going to encode the labels today. I'm going to leave them as M and B. Uh, sklearn doesn't really care if they're encoded this way, uh, but some other libraries like TensorFlow will uh, give you an error if they're not encoded uh, as unique integers from 0 to number of classes. Minus 1. So let's train on the original data. Uh, so I'm going to create a model called Actually, we'll call it original model. So I'm going to make another one later. This will be just a simple logistic regression model. Uh, and we're going to fit the, uh, sorry, this is original model. We're going to fit it to the train set, x train, y train. So this is going to uh, make predictions uh, based on the train set, compare them to the answers we have in the y set, and then refine until we have a good fit. Uh, actually, I also want to print out the score. So I'm evaluating it on the test set, uh, comparing it to the uh, Y test, and then I'm going to print out a, uh, this will be a an accuracy score. By default, this score function returns accuracy. So we can print out uh, model accuracy, original data. Uh, yeah, and I'll, I'll format it to have two decimal points dot format passing in the score. Uh, one more parenthesis. Oh, sorry, it's I, it should be original model. All right, uh, oh yeah, so it's 0.99, so that's very good, 99%, but I actually want it as a percentage. 
So I'll put a percent here and I will multiply this by 100. So we have 99.42%. Uh, why don't we display it to five decimal places? Okay, so um, this is very good, right? We have a great fit. Um, now we could just stop there, but I wanna show you how PCA works. So basically we have um, 30 columns, right? So there may be um, some better way to express the same information uh, in the set, in the data set, uh, but using fewer columns. And that's what principal component analysis addresses. So principal component analysis is used for two main purposes. Uh, it can either be used just to reduce the dimension of the data, or it can also be used to visualize patterns in high dimensional data. And the way that works uh, for visualization is you would reduce the dimensions down to two and then plot them uh, on a graph. Uh, but we're gonna use it for dimensionality reduction. Uh, and I'll explain a bit about how this works. Let's actually create the PCA object first. So this is PCA from sklearn, and we are gonna specify a number of components to, to generate. So end components, uh, let's set it up here. How about we do uh, two to start? Um, so uh, this will just be end components. And then we're gonna fit PCA to the train set. And so basically the way PCA works is it looks at the data, which is in a very high dimensional space. In this case, it's in 30 dimensional space. You can consider each training example as a vector pointing to a location in 30 dimensional space. And if you consider it that way, I mean, you can't actually visualize 30 dimensional space, um, but you can imagine it in three dimensions, right? There's uh, a, a vector is pointing somewhere and then each example has a new location. And you can think of all those data points in space as taking some sort of shape. And um, there is some axis along which this data varies the most. And you can think of uh, that axis, it may not be one of these features, right? It's some combination of the features, uh, but it's, it's the direction in which the data tends to vary the most. And a principal component analysis is a way of actually capturing what that uh, direction is. Um, and it will find, uh, it, it will rank the dimensions across which the data varies the most from uh, most variance to least variance um, up to 30 uh, different uh, dimensions. So basically it will reform the features. We'll have 30 new features. If I keep this as 30, uh, then it will sort of reshape, it'll keep the same dimension, but it will, um, so we'll get new features out of it. It's, it's sort of a difficult concept to explain, um, but basically if we, if we bring this down to two, it's going to take uh, that, let, let's say we brought it down to one, then it would find just that uh, direction across which the, the data varies the most, and it will squash all the other uh, dimensions down so that we'll only have a single number line uh, that represents um, some new feature that's basically a combination of all the other features. So um, let's actually see how this looks. So we're gonna fit it to the train set and we're going to uh, transform the train set and call it PC train. Uh, and I'd like to, let's actually make this a, a data frame because this will return a NumPy array, which is a little boring to look at. So we'll make it a data frame. Um, and I'd like to give it some column names. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna call the columns, uh, the, the respective principal component names. So PC plus I, uh, where I is a number. So PC1 means the first principal component. Uh, and that PC1 is the principal component across which there is the most variance. And then PC2 is the uh, the axis across which there is the second most variance and so on. And I'll show you that in just a moment. Uh, but we're gonna call PC1 indexed by I here. So this is a string of I. And since uh, if we're doing it in a range, it'll start at zero. I'm gonna do plus one uh, for I in range and components. And we'll do the same thing for the test set. 
Oh wait, I've missed this. All right, so this will be PC test, and we're transforming PC, uh, X test here. All right, so if I run, oh no, what is? What's oh I forgot this. Okay. All right, so let's look at PC train. So this is uh, PC one, right? And now if I bring this up to two, then we get two. Okay. So it's. This can go up all the way to 30. Sorry, 30. Uh, in which case we have uh, 30 new features, but PC1 being the most important feature. So what I mean by that uh, is if we, let's plot the variances of each um, feature. So what I mean by variance here is uh, variance in the original data. So this guy is capturing the infer like th this this variable here is a it's a representation of uh, movement across the direction of most vari of greatest variance in the original data. So let me show you. Uh, we'll make a figure with fig size of 16 by 10, uh, and I'll make it a seaborne bar plot. Uh, so the x-axis will be um, yeah. PCA has this attribute called explained variance ratio. And basically um, this shows the percentage of uh, variance in the original data that's captured by each principal component. So if I, if I display it as a uh, bar, bar graph it will make a lot more sense. So I'm going to set the PCA.explained variance ratio on the X and the Y will be uh, the names of each principal component. So Y will be the same as this. Uh, okay, and then I want to set the XLM to uh, from 0 to 1. And I want to give it a label, proportion of variance in original data. Uh, then I want to give it a title, Principal Component Variance, and we'll show. Uh, let me just, oh yeah, I actually want it as a horizontal bar plot, so I'm going to set orient equals h, and I'll give it a color palette as well. Okay. Um, Right, so let's look at this. This is what I mean by uh, variance being captured by each principal component. So, principal component one captures the direction of greatest variance in the original data in 30 dimensional space. Now, I know you can't really visualize that, but you can imagine in three dimensional space, uh, if you have some like blob of data, then there's this one axis across which it varies the most. That's principal component two, uh, one. Then principal component two is going to be um, perpendicular to principal component one, but in the direction of uh, second greatest variance. So uh, principal component three is going to be perpendicular to principal component one and principal component two. And in three dimensions, uh, there's only one place that can go. That would be the cross product. Uh, but in 30 dimensions, there's many different places that could be. And ev eventually, we rank them all going down uh, until we have 30 principal components, uh, which would capture the entire 30 dimensional space. Uh, so now what I'd like to do is train on the principal component uh, data. So on the principal components. So I'm going to call it PCA model. And this is going to be a uh, logistic regression as well. And I'm going to fit it on the uh, actually PCA model dot fit. I'm not fitting on tra on X train Y train. Now I'm going to going to fit on PC train and PC test, which I generated up here. This is a plot of uh, right. So I generated them here. This is PC train. All right, and then I'm going to print out the accuracy. So this will be for the 
PCA data. And instead of original model.score, I'm doing PC mo PCA model.score. We have a problem. Why should be a 1D array, but got an array of shape? Oh, yeah, I'm trying to score it on X test. Sorry, this should be PC test and Y test. Oh, yes. This should be Y train. Sorry, so we're fitting on PC train and we're comparing it to Y train still. And we're scoring it on PC test and comparing it to Y test. All right, and we got the exact same amount, uh, exact same accuracy. So using all 30 dimensions, it makes sense that we have uh, the same uh, accuracy because this is just the same exact data restructured. Basically, it's a different way of looking at it. It's like a perspective shift in 30 dimensional space. Um, but if we lower this now, and all this does by lowering it is it, it's going to cut off like uh, all the less important principal components. So if I do two, it's only going to include these first two, and all the rest will get scrapped. And you can see if we only do two, we're actually losing a substantial amount of variance in the original data. Right? There's some good variance here, uh, which could be meaningful. Uh, but for example, if we drop 18 and below, we're probably not losing that much information. Most of the information is captured by these first couple principal components. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's try it with two. Now we only have two PCs. Uh, and if we plot this, we can see that most of the variance is in the first one, and we have a little less than half of that in the second one. So if I run this, we still have 99% with the original data. But now if I run the PCA model, uh, we get reduced performance. However, it's still not bad. You see 96% uh, with only two features now. This is literally only being trained on two features, uh, but they're the, the, most, um, the most meaningful possible features in the data. And the way that uh, these features are actually calculated is very interesting. Uh, it uses um, the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, uh, which I, I recommend you, you look at if you want. And I'm going to release a video on the intricacies of it. Um, and you calculate that using singular value decomposition. Uh, but I'm not going to go into that here. Um, and then if I, if I bring this up to, let's say, OK, let, let's say 3. Then we have three features. And you can see the variance captured by each one. And if we train, you can see we're going higher up. So the question is, what is the minimum number of features that we need to use to retain the same accuracy? Uh, so in this sort of case, it's not that important because we really only have 30 features. But you can consider if you have 1,000 or 10,000 features, this is a really great way to bring the dimensionality of the data down. Uh, to prevent overfitting. So uh, let's bring this up. Let's try it at 16. Now we have 16 features, which is still like uh, nearly a little more than half of the original data. Uh, and you can see uh, most of the variance is probably captured in these first few. And uh, we have the exact same results. So we can lower it. We don't need that many, probably. So let's bring it down to 10, see if we still get the same results. And yes, we have the same results. So let's bring it down to nine. Now we have nine features. And we get the same results. So let's bring it down to eight. And we get the same results. Let's bring it down to seven. And we got a decrease in performance. So it looks like eight is the proper number to use. Uh, these eight features capture sufficient information in the original data that it can be used to predict the test set with the exact same accuracy. And that's a bit remarkable because uh, we originally had 30 features and we're doing exactly the same performance using only eight. Um, and so you can see uh, this is a, a demonstration of just how powerful PCA is. Uh, so that will sum up today's video. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day.